Now, four in ten private companies that have published their latest gender pay gap are reporting wider gaps than they did last year, according to BBC Analysis, which looked at a company's median pay gap. That's the difference in pay between the middle-ranking women and the middle-ranking men. Of the companies that had reported by the morning of the 19th of February, 74% report a pay gap which favours men, 14% have a pay gap favouring women, and 12% report no pay gap. Only around 10% of employers have reported their latest figures so far. That's ahead of a deadline for the private sector, which is the 4th of April. Some of the companies that showed a widening gap include Enpower, Virgin Atlantic and, uh, and uh, um, some of the other big banks. So what do we need to do to try something else? Would publishing everyone's salaries help address this issue? Joining me to discuss is Professor Abigail Marks, who's work and employment studies at uh, Stirling University, and Francis Ross, who specialises in employment and discrimination law as a partner at global law firm Clyde & Co. We also have Suzanne Doyle-Morris, a consultant on improving gender balance for her business in Cluzique. Morning to all of you. Um, Professor morning. Marks, let's start with you first. Just remind us again about how we look at the gender pay gap. Who do we compare? Is it just men and women or is it average salaries, median salaries? Just tell us the easiest way to, to go about looking at it. Um, the way it has been reported today is in terms of median salaries. So if you're lining up men, you're lining up all the women in the company, it's the ones in the middle, um, which is a useful way of looking at it, but it doesn't give you a very precise or detailed picture of the gender pay gap within the organisation. And that's the problem, isn't it? There isn't, you don't really get the detail because you don't ever see who's being compared with who. No, you just get at the, uh, yeah, the, the, middle, the midpoint of everybody lined up, so middle-ranking women versus middle-ranking men. Um, it would be more useful to look at um, the mean salaries or median salaries within specific roles so you can make a direct comparison of men in particular roles against women in particular roles. Do you think publishing salaries then would help sort all of this out? If we can all see who's earning what then surely then we know whether we're being paid fairly in our own minds? I think it would be a step in the right direction um, for um, a number of reasons. Primarily because um, putting things in the public domain um, is more likely to embarrass companies into doing the right thing. Secondly, um, women typically are not as good at men at, nego at negotiating their own salaries. So if they can see what they're getting in relation to men, it gives them a very tangible measure of what um, they could be getting or maybe what they should be getting. Suzanne Doyle-Morris, you're your consultant on improving gender balance. Whenever you hear um, Abigail say there that, that it would help with embarrassing companies, is that the best way to go about <laughs> a, a achieving gender uh, balance in terms of pay? So I don't know that embarrassing companies is the best way because naming and shaming clearly has got us to a place where we're a little worse off. Um, I do believe we need to be using this data, and I welcome it every year that it comes out, but I'm not surprised that it's gone down, uh, that things have gotten worse. So Why? I don't know. It's a highly emotive issue. I mean, I think there are things we can do to improve the gender pay gap, but unfortunately it's going to be a bit of a long haul, particularly if people focus on recruitment, where a lot of my clients initially spend most of their time. In fact, I would say optimistically, <laughs> potentially that's why, it's in, why the gender pay gap has, has gotten worse over the last year, is people are putting all their eggs in, well, let's just hire in a load of entry-level women and, and hope that they get to the top. But that is not enough. Um, the clients I work with are successful when they t look at the top and what they need to do to get women into senior level positions, as well as recruitment at the bottom level. But um, Professor Marks also mentioned there that women are notoriously poorer than men at negotiating salary increases. Mm. So would it not be better for companies which do recruit women to be helping their... <laughs> given training, perhaps, to, to women to... to the research shows that when women ask for pay increases, they get slapped back much more frequently than men. So we don't socialize women to negotiate, but when we do, even when run them on training courses or have women who are very confident and try to negotiate a better package for themselves, they are much more likely than men to be turned down for those requests. 
and judged both by men but also by other women as, oh, who does she think she is asking for more money? Oh, she should be grateful for what she has. Why do you think that, that um, women who ask for more money are, are judged like that if because men aren't? Yeah, it's the way we raise our, our, our girls. Let's play nice, be agreeable, smile at everyone around you. I mean, even from the time children are very little, um, we teach girls to be as agreeable as possible. And that's what we end up being very good at. So asking for more money is a really uncomfortable thing for men and women. But when women do uh, push themselves forward and ask for more money, We, the research shows they are not successful because they're more likely to be turned down or try again in another six months' time or, ooh, uh, not with the financial cert, you know, we're not in a good position. I, I'm, I know you're keen, and let's look at this again in, a, in another year. They're more likely to be given excuses for why it's not going to happen this year, but just hold on, darling. Francis Ross, uh, you're a specialist in employment and discrimination law at, at Clyde & Co. Is that what you hear whenever you speak to people or when people ask you for advice about equal pay? That, they're, uh, that, the, women are less, that the explanation is that women are less likely to ask for more pay. Um, I, I mean, the statistics, the research shows that that is a factor. Um, there are there are a number of factors. It's in, in, in one sense, it's a self-perpetuating problem because often what dictates what someone will be offered when they're recruited to a role is um, something that is more than their current salary. So uh, if men are typically earning more than women, that's going to be continued when they move to their next role. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the, it's been identified that one of the things that employers can do is not ask about current salaries, just mm -hmm. to identify what, what they think is the appropriate salary for the, for the job and make that what is offered regardless of the gender of the candidate. What are the, the legalities surrounding this, Francis, in terms of can you find out? Or, so a woman's listening to this going, oh, that's all fine and dandy, hearing that women are more likely, less likely to ask for more, and when they do, they're more likely to get slapped down, and that everything that we've done over the last few years is leading to a wider gender pay gap. Um, what is that? What are actually the legalities? Could could somebody listening to this go to their employer and say, I want to know what that person earns because I benchmark myself against them? They certainly can, yes. Um, there used to be a statutory mechanism for that that was um, removed in 2014, but the government said at that time that they still expected that employees would be able to um, make requests to employers for information. There's no absolute on a, obligation on an employer to respond, but if they don't or they don't respond um, comprehensively, then if the employee ultimately has to go to an employment tribunal, then the employment tribunal can... Um, raise an inference from the fact that the employer wasn't willing to put forward that information. So it would always Presum be recommended... Presumably, sorry to interrupt, do, but presumably so. GDPR would stop any employer telling any other employee what somebody else earns. Do they just yes, not have to put uh, you in big groups and bands? Yes, and a, a, an individual employee's salary will be their personal data, and so it would be difficult for an employer to disclose that without uh, at least that employee's agreement to, to that, and you would imagine that most employees wouldn't be overly willing to agree to that. Um, so it would have to be anonymized, um, and as you say, done in, uh, on a basis of job or salary bands or something like that, but even that could be useful for an employee to understand where they fit within the range for their role, for example. What about publishing salaries? If everybody was to have their salary published, it was and it just became matter of course. Would there be any legal issues surrounding that? Uh, well, currently it would be a problem in terms of GDPR because, again, you would be publishing um, people's individual data, so that um, Parliament would need to, to deal with that. Um, uh, beyond that, obviously, if that's what the law required, that that is what happens in, in some other countries, such as Norway and the Scandinavian mm -hmm. countries, um, and that's that's seen as the norm there. It, it would be a big cultural shift, I would say, for the UK because it's not a very British thing for people to talk about or disclose uh, what they earn. I suppose that's the big problem, isn't it, Abigail? That it is very sort of British stiff upper lip. Don't talk about um, politics, religion, or salaries. Um, is it is it a cultural thing, or are there countries around the world? Uh, Francis just mentioned um, Norway. Yeah, I mean, other countries do publish um, much more precise salary data than they do in the UK. Um, I think people would feel very uncomfortable having their individual salaries published. Mm. Um, it is. Maybe it is a British thing. Um, but why, though? How, uh, if it's happening for everyone, why would it bother people? 
I think it's probably a historic thing. I think um, it is the problem that and whether it's gender, race or anything else, people doing the same job frequently get have very disparate salaries. Um, and that makes people uncomfortable. Maybe one of the ways of actually ensuring greater equality and fairness is to publish more precise data about individual salaries. I definitely think even though, even without, you know, naming people, you can get much more um, precise data on salaries. So how, how do the Norwegians do it? Um, I think, as was mentioned, um, it, it's, it's, it's culturally very different. Um, therefore, it becomes a lot more acceptable um, within um, the Norwegian context to publish uh, or to be much more open about salaries. And, yeah. But I just when you're saying there that in terms whether it's disability or race or gender, um, people often get paid lots of different things. It sounds there like it's becoming in, in more people's interest to have salaries published. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think it is in people's interest to have much, much more precise information about what people are paid um, in different roles in particular organisations. So I think it's in everybody's interest to know that. Suzanne, what do your clients tell you about this? So it is highly emotive. I mean, I was with one of our Scottish clients on the West Coast yesterday, and the minute you start talking about this, or specifically around succession planning, which is what I help my clients do, is get really active on their succession planning, because I know where the government says that they will wait five years before they will determine if legislation needs to be reviewed, um, if we haven't seen enough progress, but it probably will take that amount of time, because if you're primarily looking at recruitment, but also even succession planning at senior levels, it's very rare to meet a client, a corporate client who will say, yes, I think we are just overlooking at this moment loads of women. It usually takes me and my team going through and, and looking at the people that they've got in middle management and saying, not who's going to be ready in three to five years, but how do we get her ready for that next role in 18 months? Um, and what that getting her ready looks like is how do we make sure she's got the right experiences, that she's got the right support, and that she has the right backup. Because if you put a woman in a senior position or even a middle management position from entry level without support, what you're creating for her is a glass cliff. And that what ends up happening then is if she fails, everybody just kind of roll, you know, washes their hands of it and thinks, well, that didn't work. Jane, you know, was not a great thing. We're not going to we're not going to put another woman in that role. Whereas, interestingly, if uh, I was with a cl the client yesterday and, and he said, well, my concern is if we move Jane into that role, that leaves a gap. And if I put another woman in her role, that should look a bit suspicious. And I smiled and I said to him, do you ever say that when you have a man who moves up into another role and that position is still by a man and he started laughing he said no I don't think I've ever been questioned that on that all of these sound like great plans to get women to move up the organization but it doesn't necessarily address how much they're being paid to do the jobs they're moving up into though so it, it how, how do women ensure that if they are moving up the ladder they're getting paid the same the same as the man sitting next to them or the man who previously did that job well, so there is need for greater transparency, that is for certain, and also to the point that was earlier made, clearer banding. So I'm not sure I favor individuals. Um, and to answer your question about how the Nordics do it, my impression is that you can look up anyone's tax returns in, uh, in Norway, which will help you determine how much somebody earns. I think that's how the legalities of how they do it there. I'm do you not think that would work here? I don't know. It's such an emotive topic. I'm not hugely in favor of it, but I do think we need greater transparency in banding. And, and to the point raised earlier, that was great, which is also not giving people so much rope at negotiation in early stage salaries. Because you're right, if you're coming in and you're two people for the same job and one has historically earned 50000 and the other has earned 56000 it doesn't sound like a big deal. So when the person says, well, I want 56000 in this next role, well, what you're doing is every time they incrementally get an increase of even just a few percentage points, it adds up over over time for a cumulative effect of like a quarter million pounds over a lifetime. And that is why women are much more likely to retire in poverty. 
I think you've just answered a question that's being raised or an issue that's being raised by Dave in Paisley. He's mm. texted in to say, I am sick of listening to gender divisive nonsense. How did I manage to work for 40 years and not notice this? Perhaps I'm a moron. I've never worked anywhere that paid any employee, regardless of gender or ethnicity, differently than the white heterosexual male. This is now discrimination and the BBC refuses to accept it. Um, let's start with you, Abigail. Where do you want to start with Dave's text? Um, that may be the case for where he has worked, but as we can see, the data does not support that position. Mm. Um, I think um, also it may also be the case where he worked um, if it is a industry that isn't um, traditionally gendered. So if you look at the lot of the, the data that is presented, it is within it particular industries that are that are often predominantly male, not not exclusively. Um, and that is often where the problem starts. Um, and we don't, you know, I'm sure he's, you know, he has a valid point, mm. but we don't know what anybody else earns. So we can assume that men and women are being paid the same, but that might not be the case. Do you think this effort, this issue, despite the fact that what equal pay has been enshrined in law since what, the 70s, do you think it, it's ever going to, to solve itself? Um, I would like to think it's going to solve itself. I think if it does, it is going to take a long, long time because, you know, as as we know, women are um, disadvantaged in terms of pay because they do take time off work, because they're more likely to be part-time. Um, there's a whole number of structural factors that are detrimental to women's pay, um, and that would mean um, significant changes within society. Um, as well as in terms of the way organisations are managing individual salaries within them. Francis, do you see? Are you seeing more women coming to you, or are you, are you seeing it, it, it drop off now? I suppose is it becoming less of an issue? Um, no, I would say it's still very much an issue that's um, in the spotlight, and uh, the fact that the employers are blocked to report every year means that in the build-up to the deadline for reporting, there is always going to be this analysis to see who's improved from last year, who's in a worse situation. Um, and I think that means that employees are much more conscious of um, what they are paid in comparison to their colleagues and, and whether um, they're being uh, hard done by in that respect. So certainly um, I feel like I have seen an increase both in, um, in employees looking for advice on their position, but also in employers who are being asked questions by employees or wanting to check that they aren't at risk um, in this area, given the amount of publicity that it's attracting. And Suzanne, that's an interesting point there. Frances mentions that she gets questions from both employees and employers. Surely this annual chat about the, the, the gap is damaging for the businesses and it's damaging for staff morale. I think that what's damaging for staff morale is when people leave because they perceive they're not getting their fair due. And what I end up seeing with a lot of companies that I work with... But we heard there from Dave in, in Paisley who says, this is nonsense, please let just let us all just get on with our jobs, is essentially, I think, what he was saying, is that, it, it, that it, it's divisive. Yes, I, I think we all should get on with our jobs, but on equal terms. And I think what Dave is, is elaborating on is essentially mixing or equating, shall we say, personal experience, anecdotal evidence, with data from nearly 10,000 companies um, that shows that this is a, a... And I would love to know that Dave worked in a completely equal environment, and maybe he did, and the great thing is he can go on the BBC website, which has the calculator, and he can type up, who, type in his old employer's name, and maybe he will find that they are have no gender pay gap. But... The reality is the evidence suggests that if they do have, do have absolutely no pay gap, they are in a tiny, tiny, tiny minority. Suzanne, thank you very much indeed. Suzanne Doyle-Morris there, who's a consultant on improving gender balance at her business in Cluzique. And before that, we heard from Francis Ross, who's uh, an employment and discrimination lawyer at Clyde & Co, and Professor Abigail Marks, who's working employment studies at Stirling University.